Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hope everyone can hear me, inshallah. I'm a little bit farther away from the, the microphone. So today we're going to do something a little bit more interesting. So yesterday, um, I don't know if I was that engaging, so I figured maybe I'll spice it up a little bit. And I'm really sorry for the parents that are at home uh, that you may have to do science experiments from now on during the quarantine. So I apologize in advance. That's my disclaimer. So today I want to go through a little bit of an experiment. And this is not just for fun. This actually has a role to play in uh, the story itself. So make sure the kids are there and they're watching closely, inshallah. Okay, so I have a flask over here. Let me just make sure people can hear properly. The microphone's a little bit farther away. So if someone can see that it's coming on okay, I hope it is, inshallah. All right. So what we're going to do is take a little bit of vinegar and I'm sure people have done this experiment before but it's really important to make sure you have your safety goggles on all right we put this here all right so that's one part's done now the second part is a little bit of food coloring so two drops one drop and two drops. And you can use any food coloring that you want, but this is the color we picked today. So here we go, we mixed it up, and now we have a color. So remember, we have two ingredients in here. One was the vinegar, and the other one was going to be, what happens when you mix baking soda along with vinegar? you get a chemical reaction. But yes, that was really cool. Whenever you do this, make sure you have parents next to you that can help guide you because that can really explode. So when you mix two items like baking soda and vinegar, you get a reaction. Now, this is not just a science experiment for the sake of doing it because I'm bored and I want to torture the parents at home, but this has a lesson in itself and we will talk about that inshallah. So whoever's joining later, I apologize, but we wanted to start this on time for this reason. So give me a minute. I need to make sure that I get back into my other clothes. Uh, so give me just one minute, inshallah. Okay, all right. That was fun. Alhamdulillah, he wakafa was salam on ala ibadi, ladin of Safa, amma bad. But I will be lahim in a shaitani regime, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, well, ladin a jahadu fina, lenadi and nom subulana. Subhan Rabbi Karabil Hazati, amma yasifun, was salam on al Mursalin, well, Hamdulillah, he rabbil alamin. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, while I ali Sayyidina Muhammad, or Barak was salim, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم. Once upon a time, there was an Abyssinian lady who used to live in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The beloved wife of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would go and visit the masjid, and every time she sat with this lady, this woman, she, the woman would recite some words, and the words went something like this: وَيَوْمَ الْوِشَاحِ مِنْ أَعَاجِبِ رَبِّنَا so every time she sat with this lady in the masjid, she would always be saying this. And the meaning of this is, and the day of the scarf was one of the wonders of our Lord. It was on that day that he saved me from the shores of disbelief. And Aisha al would hear this over and over and over again. And she had no idea what it meant. Because what is this woman talking about? She's from a different land. Maybe it's a poem that someone in her family wrote. Maybe something from her tribe. And of course, there were poetic people, Abyssinian people were. So maybe it has some deep meaning that she didn't know. So one day she said, you know what? I'm going to just ask her about it. So she sat down with her and said, you know, every time I sit with you, you're always reciting these lines. What's the, what's the story behind these lines? Tell me. So the woman says, I was an Abyssinian slave. And I was a slave to a Bedouin tribe. So now Bedouins are people that basically are a family, a big family, and they move from one place to another. 
So back in the day, back in the day of the Prophet they used to have slaves. So they would have these slaves, and the slaves would be separated from their family because they would be doing a job for the, for the for the tribe. So she said, I was an Abyssinian slave girl to one of the Bedouin tribes. And she said, I was amongst the tribe and I had no family. So she had no connection to anybody. She had no friends. She was estranged because they would move from one place to another and she would travel with them. And one day, the daughter of the master, she came out wearing what's called a wisha, which is a scarf in Arabic language. And in this case, she had a red leather shawl or scarf you can say and this is something they would wear on their shoulders or around their waist and arabs traditionally what they would do is they would take a shawl or a scarf and they put some gold and stuff on there to make it look pretty it was basically a sign of beauty or a sign of distinction or a sign of power you can say uh, for example like nowadays when you know people are holding a certain type of purse they have a gucci purse or a michael kors perch or a coach purse yeah I, I don't know what i'm saying but i think these are the words that people use i have no sense of fashion anyway so the, the daughter of the master used to wear this wisha, which was really beautiful. One day she went to sleep. And when she slept, a bird came and it picked up that red scarf because it thought it was a piece of meat. Because from far away, it looked red like a piece of meat. And it took that scarf and it flew away. When the girl woke up, she started screaming out saying, you know, where is my scarf? Someone stole my scarf. This is something really close or something really beloved to her. Almost like how kids have their favorite teddy bear or their favorite blanket they can't sleep without. But this was something more important than that. So what did all the people do? She said that the slave girl said that all these people, the father and the elders of the tribe, they, of course, came to me. And they started interrogating me, saying, what happened to the scarf? Where did it go? Did you take it? Are you selling it? Are you hiding it? Where did it go? And, of course, they automatically assumed that she did something because she was a slave girl. She was poor, so she would need something. And so she was stealing this. So... She said, I told them what happened. I said, a bird came and grabbed the scarf and it took away, probably thinking there was a piece of meat. When she said this, her master said, couldn't you come up with something better than a lot, better than that to lie with? I mean, you could say that, you know, you could say, look, I stole it or that I'm hiding it or that I gave it to someone else. But if you're going to lie, come up with something good. I mean, think about it. You're in the middle of a desert. Oh, I lost a scarf. All of a sudden, a bird comes from the sky, grabs a scarf and goes away. It sounds very far fetched to them. So she, uh, they, they didn't believe her, obviously. And they started, what? They started searching her. They actually started beating her. And she, that's how they would treat the slaves in the past, back in the Prophet Sallallahu time, before Islam. That's how they would treat the slaves, which Islam came and corrected that. But that's a separate story. But anyway, so they would started beating her. And they didn't, while this was going on, the bird comes and it drops the scarf right between them and it flies away. And when they saw what happened, they were shocked. Because this is exactly what she said, what happened. And she screamed out to them, this girl, she said, I screamed out to them. I said, this is what you accused me of. And I was innocent the entire time. And she started to scream because this is exactly how she described it. And she wasn't lying. So what happened then was that they felt really guilty because they accused someone. And, you know, they, they said she was a liar. She was a thief and whatnot. So they freed her. So now she was a free woman in the middle of the desert. She had no family, didn't know anywhere to go. But she rem remembered that there was a call by a man by, by the name of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that he was calling to people towards Islam. And the people that were most of his followers at that time were people that were slaves and the, the weak ones, people like her that were in their situation, they, they had no power, they felt like they were nobody and the Prophet Sallallahu would bring them into Islam and they would give them, st give them status. So she made her way to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Medina and she accepted Islam. And when she, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard her story, you know, when she told him everything that happened, he knew that she was not like the other slaves in Mecca. Because the slaves in Mecca, they actually had a home. They were the first converts in Islam. They were becoming Muslim. This was a woman who had no family, no friends. She had nothing and she came to the Prophet ﷺ. And he understood that. He knew he couldn't just say, okay, go find a place for yourself. He understood how special she was. And what did he do? He made her a house in the Masjid Nabawi. What he did was he went to one part and he made a low roof and made almost like a mihrab. He built it and he put a tent inside the masjid, a home inside his home so that she can stay there. In the eyes of everyone, she was a no one. She was some Abyssinian slave, but the Prophet ﷺ understood her value and he gave her a place. So I don't think anyone knew about this part of the story, but the next part everyone knows about. 
the next part of the story is that this was the same woman that is famous for cleaning the masjid. Right? She was known as a woman that cleaned the masjid. The thing about this woman was that she wasn't hired to clean the masjid. Right? It was not that they brought in a slave. Hey, your job now is to clean the masjid. She was given a place by the Prophet ﷺ and she was so grateful. And what she would do, anytime she would notice some, anything in the masjid, she would go and pick it up. And so that's why she became the cleaning, you know, the cleaning uh, woman. It was her love of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and just being grateful that she was there, right? She understood that everything that happened to her, you know, being a slave, being in the middle of the desert, this whole story with the, with the bird coming and taking and, and her being humiliated and then Allah, you know, freeing her, that she came, all this Allah made it happen so that she can come in front of the Prophet sallallahu and she can take the shahada and be a Muslim. And that's why the Prophet understood her. And that's the story. And that's why this lady, whenever she would sit with Aisha, Allah, she would always hear, say the, those words, rabbina, And the day of the scarf was one of the wonders of the Lord. It was on that day that he saved me from the shores of disbelief. And this is what she was referring to. So what happens that, you fast forward, one day the Prophet Wasallam comes out and he notices that she wasn't there the whole day. And he wondered where she was. You know, he noticed it right away. People may not have noticed it, but he was very keen. He knew exactly, even though there were so many Sahaba, he knew exactly where everyone was. He knew what they did. So he was like, where's this person that cleans, cleans the masjid? And the Sahaba said, uh, you know, she died last night. And she died at such an odd time that we don't want to wake you up. So we went and go ahead. We went and did the ghusl and we did janazah on her. And the Prophet, you know, she's thinking, he's thinking, she died in the masjid of the Prophet. She had her home built by the Prophet in the masjid. And she took shahada with the Prophet. So you can see why he was so concerned and why he asked about her. Because she had no one else. So, but the Sahaba thought that it was not the right time to bother the Prophet ﷺ and to pray the janazah. So instead, they did it all without him. When the Prophet ﷺ heard that, he was so angry and so upset with them. And the reasons were because what? Number one, they thought she was a nobody. And that's why they didn't wake the Prophet ﷺ up during that time. Because, and, and he understood her importance, but no one else did. If it was another Sahabi, let's say it was Abu Bakr or Umar they would of course wake the Prophet in the middle of the night because, oh my God, this Abu Bakr or Umar that passed away, you have to come and do janazah. But because this was just the lady that cleaned the masjid, they thought she was no one. And they said, you know, we're not going to bother the Prophet we're just going to do this ourselves. And the second reason was because he wanted to pray the janazah on him, on her himself. Right? And he told the Sahaba, take me to her grave. Don't you know that these graves are lit up by my prayer for them? And the messenger, messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, goes to her grave and he prays over her grave. And this is the only incident in the Sina that we know where janazah was done twice: once by the Sahaba and once by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself. You know, you may think that oh, she already had a janazah, and you know, the best of generations already went and did janazah, but he found her so valuable that he wanted to go and pray the janazah on herself himself. Because he knew there was something very special about the woman and he wanted to honor her as well. And so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on that woman and grant her companionship of the Prophet ﷺ in the Akhirah. Prophet. Now there are a lot of lessons we can take from this story. So what are they? If you think back to the experiment that we did, when we had to add the baking soda and the vinegar. And for people that join in late, if you go back to the beginning of the recording, you'll see the experiment that we did. So when you added the baking soda and the vinegar, what happened? It was to highlight that when someone has both sincerity and a good deed, when you combine both of them, it forms a reaction which propels us towards Jannah, right? It takes us closer to Jannah. If you have sincerity, but you don't have any good deeds, it's not going to get you anywhere. And you can do good deeds, but if you don't have sincerity, meaning you don't do it only for the sake of Allah, that deed is not going to get us anywhere. For example, let's say you're about to pray Salah. You know, it's a really good deed, obviously. You're, you're going to pray Salah and you stand up because you want to. And now all of a sudden, your friends are there. And you want your friends or other people to see and say, wow, mashallah, look how, oh man, I want to really show off to them how, how deep my prayers are. You're standing there and you're like you're nodding back and forth and saying, alhamdulillah, even though a Zohar prayer, you don't read out loud, you're, you do extra stuff because you want to show off, right? That pl- the prayer loses its value because it didn't have any sincerity in it. We didn't pray for the sake of Allah and to please Him. We did it to show off. 
So this woman had both of these ingredients and that's why she was so special to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the Prophet sallallahu The second lesson we can take from this is that we never judge people by the criteria other people, people of this dunya judge, pe- judge people others by. What do I mean by that? When we look at people, we think they're really cool or they're really hip or they're really awesome. They're more successful. Who, who are these kinds of people? Right, the ones that drive the really cool, expensive cars, the ones that are maybe doctors or lawyers, and and they live in rich, big mansions. Right, the ones that have really, really nice houses. Or is it you know the kids that have the best toys? Oh, they, he has a he has the best system. He has both an Xbox and a, and a Switch, and also PlayStation too. He's the best person, right? Or someone that's famous and a celebrity. Do you think that they are uh, they are the best people? But when is the last time we looked at the people that cleaned our masjid? And I mean, actually looked at them, not looked at them and just passed by them, right? And ignored them. Or worse, do we look down on them? Right? I can tell you a story that in our hospital, one time I was going up the elevator and the elevator stopped on a floor and one of the cleaning people, they called them environmental services people. They also wanted to get on the elevator because they had to go upstairs also. But they didn't just get on the elevator. They said, and I was waiting for them to get on, they said, is it okay for us to get on the elevator and i said yeah of course it's okay you know it shocked me that they wouldn't ask, they would even ask saying you know why why would they even want to ask because i had to go upstairs and i went on the elevator and they have to go upstairs they should also just get on the elevator and go so why do they need to ask and of course one of my bad habits is that i always want to know more i, I won't just leave a situation so i couldn't resist and i asked them I said you know why did you ask me that question it, to me it sounded silly they said that sometimes when there's doctors in the elevator they don't want us to be on the same elevator, elevator cart as them. And I was, subhanAllah, I was so shocked and blown away by that, that. Just because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made these doctors who they were and made these people who are part of environmental services, who actually, if you look at it, they're actually more important than the doctors because they're the ones that make sure that after a patient leaves, the, the place is cleaned completely with so much sanitizer to wash all the germs away because if they didn't do our job, then the patients that would come in, they'd be even sicker. Right? These are the people that, you know, whenever there's a spill, they would clean up. And if they didn't, people will slip and fall. So these people actually are the most important people because of their but because of their status, they're called environmental services, you know, or sanitary engineer or whatever they call it. You know, doctors thought that they were better than them. Right? So that they had this pride in them that they wouldn't allow someone like these group of people to ride on the same elevator cart as them. And since that day. I started being actually extra nice to them and always say, you know, hi, how are you? How's your family? You know, what vacation did you go on? Because I did not want to be one of those doctors, especially as a Muslim that looked down upon others and make them feel that I'm any, uh, that I'm any better than them. The point of this is that we never know who's close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the special people and who they are, right? If you look at the Haramain right now, actually, it's a perfect example, Makkah and Medina. This, there's barely anyone praying right now and likely for some time. Right? Except for who? The chosen ones. Uh, the imams. And you know who else is praying with them if you look at the videos? The people that clean the masjids. You know those people that you watch videos where they, they have these you know squeegees and they're making a little game and they you know clean the whole area? Right? People just ignore them when they, get, they think it's a big show, they watch it. But right now, when the whole world, you know, we, we have the money, we have jobs, we have the ability to go anywhere we want, we just get on a plane and go. But what, if you look at the, and all we can do right now is what? We can't go there. All we can do is look at the YouTube channel, right? And that's as close as we can get. Forget about praying in it. But who do we see praying in there? Right, the people that clean. Why? There must be a reason. Because a lot of these people, I can tell you from personal stories that these people, some of them actually had great jobs. They had a lot of, you know, things they could do back home. But they said, we want to clean the, the masjid of the Prophet So we never know that, you know, who is close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the point of this is not to say, oh, you know what, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to go become a cleaning person because they have so much status. No, that's not what the point of this is. The point is the point of this is that we should never look down on anyone. Everyone has a story. And sometimes these things happen for a reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us go through it so that we love him more and get attached to him more. I can tell you, if you talk to your parents and ask them, you know, they may be, they may have been born as a Muslim, but every incident in their life that really made them think about being a true Muslim. That they want to start acting like a Muslim and doing the things that they do. There's always a story that they have. And I, I encourage you, especially in this quarantine time, we can't go anywhere anyway. So you might as well ask your parents or your friends, hey, why, why did you, when did you start becoming like this? And I can tell you, everyone has a story.
They may not share it with you. Sometimes they're embarrassing and they don't want to share it with you. But everyone has a story about how, what happened, what drove them to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the same way this woman, that's what she thought. She said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought me. I am so grateful to him that I am going to do my part and clean this masjid because it's a house of Allah. He brought me here to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she was the lowest, you know, you can say at that time, the slaves were the lowest of the low. But because of her truth and sincerity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised her status to the status of a sahabiyah. And someone is asking, what's her name? You know, we'll talk about that later. And all this went to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the Prophet sallallahu made part of the masjid home for her. And not only that, she had two janazas for her. All from what? One incident. The what? The incident of saying the truth and she took a beating for it. And that's the third lesson. That sometimes it's very difficult to tell the truth. And yes, we will get in trouble for it in this life. But know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching everything that we do. You know, especially whether we're kids or adults. Everyone lies in their own stages. You know, we break a toy as a, as a kid. We say, oh, I didn't do it. You know, my, I have a two-year-old daughter, uh, Zainab. Anytime something happens or she does something, you ask her. And she says, Ibi did it. So that's just nature because they want to blame someone else. They, they don't want to they don't want to get in trouble because if they get in trouble, you know the parents are going to yell at them. So she said, Ibi did it. Even though he was nowhere, he's not even at home, he's at school, she blames him for it. So in the same exact way, when we break something, we feel really bad. Or you know, we want to hide it or we put it away. And and we say, Oh, I didn't do it. But this woman, she said the truth. And she didn't know she was going to get in trouble for it. Maybe, maybe she thought they would really you know, believe her that a bird came and took that shawl and went away. But she knew that she wanted to say the truth. And it was difficult in this life for her. But we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching everything that we do. Just like we talked about yesterday, the three advices that the Prophet ﷺ gave Mu'ad bin Jabal were at the last, last advice that he asked. He said what? Haythu ma, haythu Be conscious of Allah wherever you are. Because we never know which deed might be the story of how we become close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how we become beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last lesson from the story is that she didn't publicize her deeds. You know, she saw garbage and she picked it up. She didn't make a scene. She didn't say, who made that mess? Come and clean it up. Oh, I'm going to do it. Oh my God. You know, it's like our parents tell us to do a chore. What happens? Say, can you take the trash out? It's like, oh, this thing is so heavy. Baba, I'm just dragging it. Look how much work I'm doing. Or he tell them to take the recycling out and they're dropping things all over, making a scene, right? But she didn't even, nobody even told her to do it. She wasn't hired for that job. She wasn't even a slave that was brought in to clean. She did it because she loved the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But she didn't make a scene. So much so that people didn't think she thought she was nothing. They thought she, she was of no importance at all. And that's really, really important in this day and age because with social media, we have Facebook, Twitter. You know, we feel like we have to tell everyone everything that we do. You know, forget about the good deeds. We also, you know, you know, advertise with the bad things that we do, right? We have to tell people everything that we did, including what we had for lunch. We have to post our lunch on Twitter. We have to post our dinner on Instagram, our midnight snack on Facebook, and put ourselves out there because how will anyone know who I am? If I don't post, if I don't have those TikTok videos that go viral, well, who's going to find out about me? But... That's not what our goal is. We have to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching us. Even if someone, you know, watched something we did and they say, good job. So what? They can't give us anything. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw it and he accepted it and he's always watching and seeing everything. And if he accepts that, that's all that matters for us. Right? And this is why, you know, you do things for the sake of Allah. And we have to be very, very careful about this day and age because the more exposed our deeds are, the bigger the chance that shaitan has to change our intention on why we're doing it. Like wanting to be famous or wanting to show off. Because we know that if our deeds have any even grain of riya, basically which is what? Showing off. Then that deed is not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like having a good deed but no vinegar to make the explosion happen to get us close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So there are times when we do things and people see them. But we should always have a hidden stash of good deeds that nobody knows about. In the middle of the night, when people are sleeping, that's when you go and take the trash out, right? When people are sleeping, we go and do the dishes. Not in the not in the kitchen, banging and making everyone up, waking everyone saying, oh, mashallah, my son, my daughter is downstairs and they're doing dishes. No, that's not what we do it. We do it for the sake of Allah so that only is between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Because those are the only deeds that we know we did it only for Allah because nobody's watching us. It's easy to do, read the Quran when people are watching you and, you know, read out a really good recitation, mashallah, you know, people are saying, subhanAllah, what a beautiful voice. But the Quran recitation that we do quietly on the side when no one's watching, that is more beloved to Allah because that's just us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You'll see that a lot of times when people are reading by themselves, they'll read in a regular tone. When the people are around, they really start, you know, busting out, right? Why? Because they want people to say, mashallah, what a great voice you have. So anyway, the other part of this is that we should not downplay any deed, right? Like helping clean up the house, taking the trash out, vacuuming, cooking, changing diapers, running errands, you know, doing groceries. And this applies to everyone. It's not the job of the mother to do all these things. Well, she will bored because she always does it without ever complaining, right? But we should also be helping in everything we can because we never know which deed becomes beloved to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and can be a means of us getting into Jannah. We have so many different stories from, from the past about, you know, the, the child that, you know, waited for his mother and father because he wanted to give them some milk and they fell asleep and he waited by them all night long holding the glass of milk and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved that. So we never know. I'm not saying that, you know, tonight go and when, when they fall asleep, hold a glass of milk and wait until they wake up and say, look, I did this for you. No. Whatever your situation is that you should always try to do good deeds as many as you can because we never know which one will be accepted. You know, one of my teachers said something very beautiful. He was, uh, we were doing tarawih in someone's basement and he gave a talk after after four sessions and he said, you know, the reason why we pray so much and we do so much sajdas and sajdas after sajdas is that our hope is that Allah's pamiya and our akhirah is made. Right? And that's the thing we have. And that's why we do so many sajdas that we never know which one Allah is going to, which one Allah is going to uh, except so the interesting thing about this story is that you know like someone asked what is the name of the sahabiyah the interesting thing about the story is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved her so much right and because she was so hidden you know we don't know what her name is at least I don't know I haven't come across it she's just known as a lady that cleaned the masjid right she wanted to stay hidden so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept her hidden too so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Allah always allow us to tell the truth, no matter how difficult it may seem. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He does not allow us to look down on anyone. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He allows us to do good, good deeds that are hidden from people's eyes, and that He accepts those and makes it a means of getting close to Him and becoming His beloved and entering His Jannah. Wa akhiru dawana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.